This is Adel Corker. I'm the founder of the CEO of the AB Corker Foundation for Mental Health. Our webinar topic today is related to a very important aspect of mental health, that is trauma. Uh, Dr. Daoud, uh, Dr. Issam Daoud, will be uh, discussing the critical importance of mental health first response in acute psychologic trauma. Dr. Dawood is a psychiatrist and psychotherapist who grew up in Israel in a small Arab Palestinian village in the, in the Galilee. Um, he specialized in child and adolescent psychiatry and graduated from the psychoanalytic school. Dr. Dawood is the co-founder of Humanity Crew, which is an organization that provide mental health first aid to refugees in the Middle East. Dr. Dawood, uh, uh, thank you for being here, and we are all looking forward to your presentation. Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Adel, and all the team uh, um, for for um, having me um, here with you. Um, and uh, you know, um, the 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 mental health first response is like. Um, this kind of you know part of mental health services that is, is so neglected you know if we are talking about mental health services or support as, as something that is not available for people and that is not enough uh, just imagine what what the situation when we are talking about mental health first response is something that is rarely available for people and also there is a, a lot of lack of information about the importance of of first response, and, um, and that not just in the field of uh, humanitarian aid, where most of my work is, but also in our daily life, uh, uh, when we are day, you know, the fires that we had in in California recently, of floods, and and other issues that even as a small families can happen, like a, a car accident. And something that just imagine how much this kind of uh, service or need is is so neglected by us and also by by professionals like uh, when we go to a doctor usually it comes later like one month two months three months later that he would say okay maybe you're gonna need to see a psychologist because of what you are going through now uh, due to that car accident or losing your someone you beloved or due to an, an assault that you had suffered before. And this three, four months until a professional, our physician or, or, um, or when we, uh, you know, ask for help or, uh, you know, reach out to, to receive uh, uh, psychological support or psychiatric support regarding the trauma that we suffered from, it's it's a little bit late sometimes because it's a, a huge difference uh, in 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 terms of the prevalence of success of the treatment and the recovery rate and the whole impact of the traumatic experience on, on us when we actually approaching the help and and the, receive the support as close as to the, the the to the time of the trauma is happening and I will try in my uh, presentation today not to go deep in neuroscience. I'm not going this to make this complicated that much. I'm not also, uh, you know, the best neuroscientist on earth. But I will try really to make everyone, no matter if you are a family doctor, a teacher, or a psychiatrist, or even a surgeon, or a taxi driver, to really understand or you know that the importance uh, and the critical importance even of of mental health first response when we are suffering from a traumatic event and doesn't matter what kind of of traumatic event it is um before we go a little bit deep i just want to share with you something how this you know the whole thing about trauma started in, in back in the history the first time that ever there was a um um, you know, uh, any kind of uh, description of uh, of um, uh, the, the negative uh, consequences of trauma 
uh, which is here in this description is, is more or less about nightmares and flashbacks, which is part of the post-traumatic stress disorder. It was way back in the, when the Greek biographer uh, Plotarch wrote uh, in the second century an autobiography uh, about nobles, Greek and Romans. It's the lives of the noble uh, Greek and Romans about fighters. And he, he, he talked about um, Gaius Marius. He was like a Roman fighter. And he described uh, that in his book that uh, the, the overpowering thought of a new war, of a fresh struggle, of a terror known by experience to be dreadful. This was actually the first time ever, and you see that it's back before Christ, that someone actually described the, the, the damage that trauma can do to us. But in a very, you know, weird and and surprising for me when i start looking at this as a young medical student later as a surgeon uh, i used to be a surgeon for a couple of years and then i switched to psychiatry that the first time that they actually talk about trauma as psychological trauma it was just only thousands of years later in the 1889 when the neurologist herman oppenheim describe a traumatic neurosis. And it was a description of, of some kind of symptoms that he saw of a um, group of people who were a survivor of a, of a train accident. And it took thousands of years to, to give the, uh, you know, a description or to, to make uh, any kind of relation between the trauma, which is, the wound in Greek language, like which usually talks about physical trauma, to link it or to start talking or describing something which is related to our mind and soul, our mental health. And it's unfortunately, it wasn't that, you know, in 1889 it started and now it's developing. It takes years later to start really talking about the psychological trauma or the trauma that also affect us not only physically but also mentally from things and traumatic experiences that we have that we go through and this leaves us so exposed to the negative impact of of the trauma and it's controlling our life and decisions and we will see how uh, in the coming slides but actually it makes us and it shape our life and and many many things in our life and, and decision that we take is actually driven by trauma this like about driven by traumatic experiences we go through if we just want to define trauma and, and types there's many many others and most probably everyone will if i ask in the street even what's trauma is it most of probably everyone will answer the same. It's not that, you know, even though there's like many definitions, but all of them is talking about the same thing. It's an event that is sudden, unexpected, that threat our life and physical integrity and well-being. And for children is also threatening the life of the caregivers. And it's outside of the normal experience. This is more or less the definition of, of trauma. You can, you can find like different uh, versions here and there and different definitions according to the APA, American Psychology Association, or the, or the, the European one, and et cetera. But all of them is talking about the same thing. It's like an overwhelming event, a negative one, which is sudden, unexpected, that threat our life and integrity and physical integrity, and it's outside of our uh, uh, normal experience. And this event, uh, uh, you know, lead us to and may develop later to many other, uh, you know, um, um, create some disorders that the most, you know, known uh, disorder is the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder. We can say like, this is like, you know, the, 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 the most um, common, I don't think it's it's a common in types of prevalence, but it's more the the well-known uh, disorder that 
if you're asking or talking with someone about trauma, he will talk, okay, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's linked a lot to veterans, to, to soldiers coming back from the war, like in the US and from Iraq. And this is why it's like PTSD is, is a well-known and, and, and people are aware of this disorder. But if you look at the, uh, the trauma um, in terms of duration of the symptoms after the trauma, we will see that the post-traumatic stress disorder by definition, and also as we see here, it, it comes later. It's, it's, it needs to have more than one month since the traumatic event. So what happens before? So like all the treatment that we give to soldiers or to people who survived the 9-11 or to refugees who arrived to Greece or to Germany or to, to the US and people who cross borders and flee war, <clears throat> all of them, we are actually sort of treating their post-traumatic stress disorder and symptoms, which is, as you see here in the slide, it's like symptoms that are more than one month uh, uh, um, according you know, to the after the traumatic event. So what happened before, in the first month, in the first hours, in the first minutes before, when, when after the traumatic event, what's actually is going there and what we can do at that time? Unfortunately, nothing is being done in, 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 in terms of plans or like programs. In, in, if you look at the first responders, and now when there was the fire in California, the COVID-19 pandemic, like what kind of intervention we are doing related to mental health? I think maybe only the AB Corker Foundation is have some kind of plans and, 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 you know, webinars and resources to deal with it now when it's acute. And we will see that later, year to years after this, we will be dealing with a massive pandemic, which will be more damage and it would cause more damage than the COVID-19 itself, and it will be a mental health pandemic that will be a, a cause, and it will be because of the not dealing with the, 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 the pandemic in the acute phase in, in the aspect of mental health. So in the first minutes and hour after a traumatic event, we, we have symptoms and signs that called peritraumatic symptoms. These signs, and uh, it's it's... Um, something that, you know, about fear, when we uh, um screaming, we are shaking, we may be like, we can faint or uh, um, lose control about, um, you know, our uh, 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 GI and we can have uh, 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 hyperventilation and... Uh, uh, disorientation and some kind of automatization feelings and etc. And after this very shocky, you know, shock reaction, we go to uh, a phase of that last until one month that we call the acute traumatic symptom. And the acute traumatic symptoms is very similar to post-traumatic stress disorder and post-traumatic symptoms. And it more about, <clears throat> you know, remembering the accident and you know, having some kind of feeling of guilt and sometimes a feeling of depression, oh, why it's happened to me or why this happens to me and I can't sleep, I am remember this every day. And day by day, there's some kind of improvement and then it, it's, it, it's, it's fade out and we recover. And if it stays, then it become a post-traumatic stress disorder or other uh, uh, disorders that, you know, uh, uh, um, also affect our life and make make our uh, you know function harder day by day. Like anxiety, we can suffer from uh, depression, adjustment disorder, and other and other uh, and somatic pain uh, and complaints and many other uh, symptoms and disorders that can cause later after the the, the acute phase of the trauma. So. Why to wait until the post-traumatic uh, uh, symptoms to, to, to appear? If we can do something minutes or hours later or during the first month. And this is 
where it comes the importance of mental health first response. This kid back in the in the in the in the, in the back of this slide is Omran. This kid, if you remember this picture is from like last, I think three years ago, it's from Aleppo in Syria. He was an he he just uh, the white helmets, the first responders in the white helmets, they 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 uh, rescue him from uh, after uh, um, his building and house was bombed, and he was sitting in an inside the ambulance, and this picture was taken, and. For me, as a child psychiatrist, as a rescuer, as an activist, and, and, and someone who works in the field of, of um, um, you know, uh, in, in crisis zones around the world, it's, it's, it was like one of the saddest pictures in, in my life. A lot of people see this mixed with joy and happiness because they succeed to, to rescue him. Um, they were heroes and they are heroes for sure. But for me, as a child psychiatrist, I had a dream to be there next to him. At that moment, at exactly that moment, to sit next to him and to talk with him and to do the intervention now on that scene, on this ambulance. Because if I do this one month, two months later, when he will be in Turkey or in Greece or even in his hometown but after he recovered from all of this it will be too late i can help for sure but why to wait until then to treat the disorder that will be developed if i can prevent it why to wait until someone will have a heart attack so i will do for him a cpr or i will do a, a, an open heart surgery if i can do an intervention before all of this to prevent the heart attack and this is the same situation. You did the great thing and you rescue his body, but what is going on with his mind and soul now? Look at his face, he's freezing. This is a face of a human being that he is overwhelmed and freezed because of the huge amount of a negative impact with, with impact, like tra traumatic experience that he's, 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 he's cannot actually understand and he cannot you know deal with so the mind and the soul will use a very primitive defense mechanism called split i the this is how we will split we have the body and you have the mind and both of them are not the same that's why the only way that his soul and mind and his mental state can deal with this situation is by splitting this I, they are not one anymore. And when he will calm down, then they will be back again. The problem is that this is exactly how PTSD, post-traumatic disorder and other mental health issues developed. Because PTSD is based on split, good and bad. The bad that comes with all the memories, flashbacks, smells, everything, and the good which is different, which is in, in its, its lo in location geographically, and also even in our brain, these memories are stored in different place. Imagine trauma as, sorry for the for the com to compare this, but as a desktop of of your laptop. It's like endless of folders all over the, the desktop. In each folder, you have different things, different memories and smells from the incidents, from, from this traumatic experience. And in the future, different reminders will open different, different uh, folders. And these folders will activate when you open it, sometimes, you know, the smell, screaming, and, and from that, traumatic event there is no one folder that contain everything that have the good and the bad for this for this child for example in the picture there's a folder that with the smell of the blood there's a folder for the screaming there is a folder that have a smile of the the rescuers who took him who was like very happy he succeed to 
to uh, to help him there is a folder for for him uh, feeling that he is cold and fear and but there is no one that tells the whole story and if we succeed in doing an intervention for a kid like this when the trauma is happening then what we can do and what we do actually is that we open one folder that contain all of this we have one narrative even though this narrative is hard and even though this narrative is traumatic at the end this narrative will be one and in one narrative there is good and bad so if there is any external reminders or internal reminders in the future that will open this folder in this uh, uh, desktop it will be all together it's not just different things and when all together will be activated so it also the smile of the rescuers and uh, the, the the nice feeling of the nurse in the hospital and also the the smell of the blood but the smell of the shampoo later all of them will be one experience so it will not be any more traumatic it will be hard it will be processed and this is the important to provide this on on site in real time and if we want to do this, and if we want to provide this, we need to understand many aspects in, in as, as I said, I will not make it a neuroscience lecture, but I will share with you very briefly how trauma just developed in our brain and how we can actually by the right intervention that doesn't need you know the professor in psychology to do it or a psychiatrist to do it is anyone can do it as anyone can do cpr when he's found someone with a cardiac arrest there is no reason why no one with any kind of background but with the right training to do a resuscitation but for for the mind and the soul and to do so we need to understand how trauma impact us what you see in the slide here is our brain it's very simple for some very complicated for others but the the part that we want to talk about is is the frontal part what we call the prefrontal cortex which is in 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 paint here in in shown in red and the prefrontal cortex it's important to us because in my you know i think a lot of people will agree with me it's the most important part and this is the part that makes us different than animals why because the prefrontal cortex is it's the brain re re region that implicate in planning complex cognitive behavior it makes our personality expressions and decision making and moderating social behavior the basic activity of this brain region is to consider like it's like an orchestra of thoughts and action and and it it in internal goals and drives it makes us decide what what is important and not and also one of the most important things is we we have the social control over there and our executive function which is talking about you know to plan things abstraction to to future consequences and you know to uh, um, to to work towards goal and prediction of outcomes and also as i say the social control like not to act as animal if you want something we will just go and kill or or rape and and we this is how we control our drive that comes from inside from like more primitive brain parts in 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 evolution so why i'm explaining this in the middle of talking about the the trauma the thing is that when we are expressing or we are going through a traumatic event the fair, one of the things that are shut down is the prefrontal cortex we lose our prefrontal cortex because we don't need it why we don't need it because it's complicate the the way that we can react as 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 a in an emergency situation as a as an human as uh, human beings to this threat of on our life 
if I want to survive from bombing, and if there's a fire now coming close to my home, I don't have time to think about if it's moral to uh, uh, to uh, steal a car and start driving and save my children and my family. I will do it, and later I will think about it. I will not be thinking about if it's what's the outcome, uh, should I go right or left? I will just run. The, the prefrontal cortex, which helps us in our daily life to to be more productive and to be um, uh, uh, people who are actually, uh, uh, you know, um, good in, in, in norms and empathy to each other, it's actually become in terms of in, 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 in trauma scene, it's something that can actually um, makes us not, not able to, to survive. And that's why it's shut down by the fight or flight the fight or flight response the fight or flight response that moderate the whole response in in crisis and enduring trauma is actually flush a lot of cortisol and steroids in our in our body makes a lot of physical uh, you know uh, reaction like uh, auditory selective auditory and you know heartbeat and it makes us and it's it makes the body ready to survive and to run for life and also, this response, as I said, is shut down our prefrontal cortex and we stop thinking logically. And then we take a lot of decisions wrong. We, we don't have the ability to overcome everything we go through. And in a way that at the end, we may pay a price. I will just give you an example about how this actually, like, um, it, um, we face this in our life, for example. One of the first things that people who are going down or recovering from um, crossing the sea, for example, in Greece, where I work f for as refugees, when they when they cross the sea, the first thing, and when they come down and and they shut down their fight or flight system, they have a lot of feeling of guilt. And when you ask them why, they say because I didn't help the old woman that was next to me in the boat. I didn't jump to save a child that was drowning and etc. And And he didn't do so because his prefrontal cortex was shut down. And when he overcome the fight or flight system, that response, he actually started gaining his prefrontal cortex and he started thinking logically and he take the right decisions. So, if we are in the right time on when the trauma is happening and we help the people who are going through the traumatic event to overcome the fight or flight response as much as faster as they can when they don't need it anymore because they already survived, then they can actually gain their ability to cope with things that they are going through to take a right decision to plan what next, not to take any more decision which is based on automatization, and also to think and to process the traumatic event. Because as much as the fight or flight response, and as much as we sh still shutting down our prefrontal cortex, there is no processing that happened to the uh, the, the experience, the traumatic event and the traumatic experience we, we went through. And this will go down to our amygdala and other parts in the brain where it will be imprinted for life as fragments of memories, as, as small fragments of traumatic experiences, not one narrative that is not processed, that it will be go and will be down there for years and as we know, up to 30 years, sometimes there's some kind of reactivation of this traumatic uh, experiences. So if we are capable and able to be on in, as, as first responders and to know that there is no first response without mental health first response, and there is no rescuers without mental health rescuers, and there is no anyone that can do any kind of humanitarian aid work or or uh, you know going to fight the uh, 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 helping people to to uh, 
to uh, survive the fires and etc without having the knowledge and the teams and training enough to provide the mental health first response i'm not talking about months and weeks and even days later i'm talking about zero to, like in time zero like all the firefighters and everything if you don't we make sure that we we are there and it's a major component of all humanitarian and crisis response then we will not be able to make the people to process this event and to actually to a, a calm down on the scene of the trauma and help them also not only store the bad memories but also to have memories of 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 um, of feeling strong that they succeed to survive to to provide them a, a, a positive experiences that they can also store this and printed in their amygdala and other parts as a whole one experience of good and bad memories. Because all the things that we will do it later, which is important, will be also stored in the brain, but in different places, not linked to the same experience, not have to do nothing with it. And, it's, and it will be good and bad in different places. And this is exactly how PTSD developed. It's bad and good, it's black and white, two different places, nothing to have to do with each other. But if we can succeed to be there when the bad thing is happening, to implant also the good things, as for this child, give me 10 minutes, 15 minutes with him, I will make him laugh. I will make him think, not as manipulating them, no. I will make him establish his own narrative of a hero kid who succeed to survive because he's a hero from this bombing. A kid like this, he's a hero. It's not a matter of, oh, he's a nice, and no, he's a hero, look at him. Like no one can survive something like this, he did. But he can't imagine, he can't understand what is happening. If you are there, helping him to shut down his prefrontal cortex, to, to reactivate the, his prefrontal cortex. You become his outside resources and you help them to process the traumatic event on real time. You provide him also good memories and good uh, pictures, mental pictures that he can store. Then he will take all of this and he will store this back in his amygdala as a bad experience, but full with good memories, one narrative, not fragments of narratives. And if the feud in the future, any time there will be any kind of reactivation, we don't care about it. We, don't, we will not be, you know, any kind of, uh, will not be afraid of this because then it will activate also our smile and our hug as it will activate the blood and etc but it will be all one narrative and we have the resources to deal with so and it's not only if we are talking about you know the field that i come from which is humanitarian work and refugees and work survival we're talking about also car accidents any kind of assault to our children or to us. If we, someone try to, to, you know, attack us, car accident we go through, we need to know that anything that happened to us, it happened to our body and to our soul and mind. And if we neglect this, then we are just actually treating ourselves like we are a refrigerator or a car. And, and it's not, we have, and which is, makes us so unique then, all other animals and machines is our really delicate soul inside us. And we unfortunately not treating this and we're not giving this the, the, the importance and the huge amount that it needed. And to, 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 to just imagine things like to the importance of this, I will bring a story that actually works. This kid, we were there for him. He was not breathing in this rescue. And it's on 28th of October, 2015. His name is Ahmad. This is Nico, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, rescuer, lifeguards. I am here in the boat. I'm doing CPRs and, and he's breathing again. And I'm sending him to the hospital. Me, Isam, the, the, the former surgeon, I was happy. I did it. 
I saved the life of a, of a kid. Later, I know from my wife that she was working in the hospital that this kid was in a catatonic state. For almost three days, he didn't even move. He didn't close his eyes. They used to close his eyes. They put an, an catheter for him. They put Zonda to feed him and fluids to give him. He didn't drink. He didn't do anything. He didn't cry. Like you, nothing. He was like a piece of wood. And Maria actually, my wife and my partner in life and also my boss and the CEO of Humanity Crew and the the the... the the drive of, of everything. She's the one that that time she 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 took the psychiatry out of me or the, the part of mental health that I was supposed to do. And I was more doing body things that time in the beginning. She's the one who was talking with him day after day in Arabic, bring him food to make him to smell the food even he didn't eat. Until after three days, he started reacting to her. And he just sat on the on his bed and he stand up and he took Maria in hand and they walked through the door of the department and he put his hand next on the door and he said in Arabic his first three words I want to go home. And when Maria told me this story, my feeling that I am the Superman who just saved the child just destroyed and I was crying like a baby for like what I did how come that I am the child psychiatrist I am the one who used to be a surgeon and 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 get moved to 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 psychiatry after you understand the importance of mental health I just forget this again and when we start working with this kid I saw the huge damage that can be that, that we, we actually prevent, starting from Maria action, which is, was the main thing. And later, weeks after, after this, when we work with him, I said, like, if Maria wasn't there, and if we don't continue working with him weeks and days later, what kind of a future actually this kid would have? What kind of success that I thought that I, I, it was a success, that I saved his life. Why I saved his life? If Maria wasn't there and if we don't continue the work with him, actually this successful CPR and this heroic uh, uh, you know, rescue, it, it worth nothing. And because of this, this is Ahmad and his family give us the permission to show his picture. And he's happy, he's in Dusseldorf in Germany. He's a happy kid, speak German. And almost, I can say, as a, as a child psychiatrist, zero, zero negative impact on him. And this is a kid who fled the war in Syria. He crossed the sea, a huge shipwreck, five hours in the sea, freezed until cardiac arrest, back to life after a successful CPR, three days, in a catatonic state, in a third level a, a hospital in a small Greek island, and another four or five days until he found his parents with the help of Maria and the treatment. And also with all of this, after the successful treatment that was given on the real and the right time, he's now with a zero negative impact. It's not because we are good in what we are doing. Maybe yes, but the most important thing that we were in the right time because if not, and you want to do the same service or support now, months, years later, then you need to do to deal with the post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health issues. Then it's not an action of prevention. It's a long process of treatment. Mental health first aid is actually one single act of prevention. And anything else, it's a long process of treatment. That's why mental health first aid is important. Mental health, mental health first aid is important because we are preventing. And to prevent, it's much easier, trust me, in medical field in general, and specifically in mental health, it's much more easy to prevent because success prevalence in psychiatry is so low and we 
you know, you all, all the time feel so bad that you can't really make people recover, fully recover. But if you want to prevent, it's much, much more easier and, 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 and successful. And all the ne thing you need is to know the importance, the critical importance of, me of mental health first response so you can actually do this and in the right time. Before I just finish, I just want to, unfortunately, because I know that everything goes around money these, <laughs> these days in our world, I want to tell you also how much money it cost us this is a very important study that has been published recently in Australia. It, it's, it's, it's a study of 10 years about the Queensland floods that happened in Australia in 2010, 2011. 2.5 million people were affected by the floods in an area that is bigger than France and Germany together. And what they saw after 10 years is is in my eyes is one of the most important findings in in the field of mental health uh, in the recent decades they found that 7.4 billion was the direct uh, damage caused of the floods and they saw also that 6.7 billion dollars was the indirect intangible uh, 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 damage of the floods and 5.9 out of this of the 6.7 was due to mental health so in total there was a damage of something around 14 mil 14 billion of the whole floods and 5.9 of this is due to mental health. That means that mental health was the major component of all the financial and economic costs of the floods. Five, almost six billion out of the 14, like all the other damages, buildings and whatever you want, just name it. They, 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 they estimate all the, the damages, everything, they really, all the small, everything, and at the end, they found that six billions only for mental health. And if you want to put also alcohol and drug abuse as part of mental health, which is, I think they should put it there, it's, it reach more. So we are talking about 50% mental health. And what's the resources that was invested during the floods? in the acute and the chronic phase and, and the, uh, on, on mental health, I, they, they don't talk about it, but I'm pretty sure it's zero or nothing almost to others. Think about the fires in California and, and uh, in Haiti and, and all over the world, all the, the natural catastrophes that are happening now due to the climate change and also due to people fleeing the war and etc. How much resources of mental health we put? and how much we put in, in first response is nothing. So if we are not talking, like if it's not important for us that, that, that you know, the, the science part or the, uh, you know, the, the importance is in, in a way of recovery even. So look at this as, as a money, a, a money, like a money on econ in, in economic cost. And you will see that this is the major component of any, disaster that can a human being go through. And it's also, if you think about it, you can take it to our daily life as individuals. When we go through a traumatic event and we say, oh, we don't want to treat it. You didn't see the damage directly, but in the future, your employment rate, your criminal record, your uh, substance abuse, all of this will be high. And we know that this is actually related to the trauma. There's a big study of ACE that they did in California that shows that, you know, it was related to, to traumatic event, even death and even a cardiac heart disease and, and other issues. So unless we start to understand the importance of mental health and the importance of providing first response mental health intervention, to, to, to people who are suffering traumatic events, then we'll be continue paying the price, economy, 
in an economic way, which is very high, but also in a personal way as, as individual and as communities and as a, in a global way, because this is how we create people with more uh, 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 post-traumatic stress disorders and other, you know, maybe not very uh, well-known disorders like the PTSD, but people who are more anxious and aggressive and substance abuse and unemployment and criminals uh, acts and etc. All of this is due to not treating mental health in general and respecting the mental health and the well-being, but also the 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 act of um, um, you know the uh, uh, providing the right thing to to us in in the right uh, in the right time. Um, this is. Um, reach us to the end. Um, thank you so much. I, I all the time like to finish all my lectures with uh, with a nice one minute video of the kid on this picture, Omar, because he has the good memory that you know. He's the the good memory that I have from a very difficult time back in 2015 when I had to confirm death for 54 children almost in in, in in few days and his smile and his kiss keeps me until now uh, you know to have a clarity and a, a drive to work and uh, he you can say that he is the mental health first response rescuer for me because he was there to do this to me I did this to him and he did this to me so um, I will share a one minute video um, um, with you um, it's him after telling him the story that he is the hero kid who crossed the sea and and how he just accept this um in a way that make him um make him a hero it's a lovely kid it's a lovely kid it's a lovely kid Thank you very much, Assam. Thank you. This, this, this was fabulous. You know, I've listened to you give a similar talk a number of times, but this time I, I really I really feel like I've learned a lot more in, in a way that I think understanding more about the, the pathophysiologic elements are happening in our brain and how we interact is really, uh, is really was very enlightening to me. So I, I really appreciate that. You know, we have a question you know, it's great that when you're there, when the situation happened to that individual and you're there, you're able to take care of them. But how could we, in a situation where we're not there, uh, that we can help them, you know, not really remember the situation and not having to deal with it? Um, you know, uh, I guess if I understand the question correctly, can you we really help them re-remember these traumatic traumas later in life to help them? You know, can we bring back the experience and then provide them the help that they need? Yes, there is many. Um, like uh, most of the the um, the uh, therapeutic approaches that uh, deal with post-traumatic stress disorder like PE, the prolonged exposure and uh, 
the focus CBT, um, trauma-focused cognitive behavior treatment, and EMDR, all of them actually work like it's they 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 talk about the same or have the same concept, which is the, what the, this question is actually uh, asking. It's to rate to take out the memories and to try to create one narrative. As I said in the in the lecture, it's like you have you you have these different folders all around the desktop and you just open all of them and you create one folder and you put everything inside and then you recreate or reestablish the narrative. So this is actually what EMDR, prolonged exposure and focus CBT is doing. The problem is that this needs a well, well trained therapist to do this. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and the prevalence of success is not that high. So yes, there is a solution for this, but it's very, you know, expensive, taking time, need a lot of resources, and it's much easier if you can prevent this rather than to, to treat this in the future. Well, uh, another question, uh, you know, in a pandemic situation, like the situation that we're in today, where we have, where we have, you know, it's it's almost impossible to really address everyone's uh, 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 situation. And everyone seemed to uh, have different traumatic experience in this, in this, right. in this situation. You know, how do we, how can we mitigate the, the mental health impact of this pandemic on the masses, mm -hmm. uh, other than having sort of individual one-on-one -on -one interventions the it's a i will i will start from the opposite like i will just give an example how actually the trauma or the being the the that our prefrontal cortex is shut down how we act look at the many what i i call them panic related behaviors when people start running to buy toilet papers. Why? Like, there is no reason. It's not like they are running to buy alcohol gel, which, okay, or masks, I, I can understand. People were running and fighting each other, fighting each other on toilet paper when nothing that have to do with the pandemic. But it's actually because of the stress. It's because of the anxiety, because they are fear from something they didn't know and they are in a in a mood of surviving and there's a fight or flight system and their prefrontal cortex is not working so if they know that there's something may help they have n no ability in their brain we don't have ability in our brain when we are in a in a in a state like this to as i said because this is the part where the prefrontal cortex is actually is doing to, to say, is it the right thing? No, it, we use it, we don't use it, and etc. So this is how we actually, when we don't address this, we pay the price. And if we want to actually make, in a pandemic situation, we want to address the, the, the whole people, not one-on-one, -on -one, we need to work in a way that the authorities understand the importance of mental health. In Israel, for example, which is funny and sad, as, as much they don't acknowledge the importance of mental health and pandemic, they, uh, the, the health department in the first time in, in March, they had an announcement said in the news, in, in all like a breaking news at the beginning. They said uh, um, uh, like there was a all the people who were in the um, the big uh, soccer match, where it was like 30,000 people, uh, need to uh, call the, the 911. And the next sentence was, only if they have fever, because there was two tested positive COVID-19 in the audience. So at that time, the 911 in Israel, the, the, the one that equal to the 911 in the US, actually had a, for the first time ever, you need to wait like up to two minutes until someone uh, answer your, the phone. <laughs> Just imagine that there is someone, maybe he really wants 911, he has like a, a heart attack or something, was waiting two minutes because 
the, the health department don't acknowledge the mental health importance. And why I'm saying this? Because they start the, the announcement with everyone who was there need to go to, to, to call only if they have fever. If they understand that people, there is panicking and there is well-being behind this, they will start it, don't panic. Only if you have fever and you were in this game, please call 911. So this is a very small example, but what I'm trying to say behind it that only if the authorities in pandemics ways and in, in general, but also in pandemics, which is the most important, they need to, add, to understand the importance of mental health. So then the whole system will be working different. The whole announcement of things, the, the regulation, the, the everything. Uh, like how you do enter a quarantine or out, out of the quarantine. But because we don't think about mental health, we don't have a problem to say, okay, tomorrow is a full quarantine for one month. Like, okay, no one will die, but people will be depressed and and domestic violence and etc. So if we want to approach or to, to give, uh, 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 you know, an answer to, to uh, what we called like a mental health of, of the pandemic, of the pandemia, we need to do this in a way that we need to involve the authorities. As much as we want to give good as NGOs, as individuals, as influencers, we can't do this. In pandemic, you need uh, 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 collaboration, you need collaborate in, like in, in a global uh, scale and also in, in national and international scale. So, uh, so you can really control the anxiety that uh, is related to the pandemic. But to do so, first they need to acknowledge the importance of this. And unfortunately, I don't see an, any uh, like any country that really understand the importance of this maybe sweden as i re i read here and there and denmark that really address the importance of mental health and they have like people thinking behind all the you know the the quarantine restriction and and in everything but in in all other countries i don't see any um anything that related to to mental health uh, and and without this we can't really do anything unfortunately yeah. Well, thank you. I, um, I I think at least the statistics in the United States has so far indicated that there's been a higher rate of uh, uh, suicide already. Yeah. And also, yeah. Uh, 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 clearly, clearly, I think we anticipate to see more more of that. I, I have to share uh, with also, you, Doctor Corker, something very interesting that we are we enter a second lock lockdown we are the only country that enter a second one and we are hopefully it will end in one week we're already one month and so i can tell you some insights from this this wave this lockdown we are in our i'm now practicing in a, and i'm working in the public service we have no no people coming in the first the first lockdown work massive after this until like last before two weeks two months we had like we we worked like crazy like people every day like new referrals kids parents in this nothing and and what we are thinking now we had a lot of discussion in the clinics and like in a group of the psychiatry and the association people are desperate and this is a, a very very dangerous level when you lose hope like you don't ask for help because you even don't think that there is help. And and this is the, the thing that we are afraid from the most because when they enter the second lock, lockdown, we say that you can't do it. People are not ready mentally to this. They say, no, no, don't worry. We will take care of the you know work and we'll pay money. And every like and, and the, the mental experts say it's not about money and work. People are not ready mentally for this. But when you don't think mental health with your decisions, you do decisions like this, and we will pay the price. Not now, we will pay it later, as you said, I'm pretty sure. Right. Well, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're coming close to the hour here, but this is another topic that I would love to have more discussion with you about, and maybe we can have another session to discuss that. Well, 
uh, on behalf of our listener and on behalf of uh, of, of the A.B. Corker Foundation, and uh, we we thank you, uh, Dr. Daoud, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, for the audience, I want you to know that uh, this uh, this event uh, will actually this webinar will be available on our website, uh, as well as it will be available in the form of podcast uh, uh, very soon. So thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in future events. Thank you, thank you. and thank you, Dr. Dawood. Bye bye.